The 1960s are widely regarded by most historians to be the longest decade in world history. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Thanks no doubt in part to the increasingly abundant saber rattling on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the world's nations came screaming out of the 50s headlong into a decade where Cold War paranoia reigned supreme. The fact that the Soviet Union had put the world's first man-made satellite into orbit at the close of the previous decade did little to stem Cold War tensions around the globe. To make matters worse, in April of 1961, the Soviets strapped a young hotshot pilot named Yuri Gagarin into a space capsule mounted on top of what could be described as an overgrown firecracker, and sent him hurtling into orbit, beating out the United States in the endeavor by a mere 23 days. Officially, the United States congratulated the Russians on their momentous accomplishment. Unofficially, however, American scientists were steamed that they had been beaten to the punch by their Soviet counterparts. Shortly after Alan Shepard became the first American in space, then-President John F. Kennedy gave a well-known speech about doing things because they are hard. Kennedy promised the world that the United States would put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, an unlikely gambit considering the American space program had yet to even send someone into orbit, like the Soviets had with Gagarin. Nevertheless, this newfound drive to put a human being on another celestial body led to the beginning of what practically everyone today knows as the Space Race, a long list of technological and human achievement that deeply paralleled the events of the tumultuous decade. In order to fulfill Kennedy's grandiose desire to land on the moon, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, went into overdrive on their work in space exploration, following up the Mercury missions with the hugely successful but largely forgotten Gemini program. Gemini was designed to push our technology to the limit, in order to prepare for a future lunar landing. Gemini, in turn, was followed by the Apollo program, which, by all accounts, was a technological masterpiece. The centerpiece of the Apollo hardware was the massive Saturn rocket. Built in stages to test the spacecraft under different circumstances, the Saturn line culminated in the gargantuan Saturn V, the largest launch vehicle ever in full operation. Towering at 363 feet, it dwarfed the Redstone rocket by a little over five times, which only a couple of years earlier had put the first American astronaut in space. Each Saturn V was a three-stage assembly. The first two stages, known as the S-1C and the S-2 respectively, were used solely to boost the Apollo hardware into low Earth orbit, while the third stage, the S-4B, punctuated the end of the parking orbit and was used to ferry the rest of the spacecraft to the moon. Combined, the three stages weighed a massive 6,699,000 pounds, and the first stage alone was capable of producing an enormous 7,648,000 pounds of thrust. Perched atop this heaving monstrosity was the uncreatively named Apollo Command Service Module and Lunar Module Spacecraft, or CSM and LM for short. Both craft were designed for a mission profile known as Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, a maneuver which saved fuel while adding a fair amount of systems redundancy in case of an accident. In short, the two spacecraft would couple after translunar insertion, then decouple once in orbit of the moon. The LM would make its descent toward the moon, while the CSM remained in orbit above. Once the astronauts were done prancing about on the surface, the LM would split in two, sending the ascent module and the astronauts back toward the waiting CSM. Once the two had returned to the CSM, the ascent module would be jettisoned in the lunar orbit, and the CSM itself would begin the journey back to Earth. Finally, for re-entry, the command module would separate from the service module for final descent, safely carrying the three astronauts back to a controlled water landing, in theory. The truth was, Apollo was largely a paper rocket. No one before had ever gone as high or as far as the Apollo spacecraft had to. As a result, a lot of the mission risks were largely theoretical and had to be dealt with on the fly. A problem made painfully evident when an accident in a test capsule horribly incinerated three bright young astronauts, Ed White, Roger Shaffey, and Gus Grissom. It was an accident that underscored just how much the administration had yet to learn in its crash course to the moon. The unmanned tests of the spacecraft continued on as Apollo 2 through 6, but the designation of Apollo 1 was reserved to honor the three who had given their lives for the program. Unfortunately, by 1968, it was becoming increasingly doubtful that NASA would even have anything to show for their years of working toward a lunar mission. Bookended by a list of world-shaking events far too numerous to list, Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo mission, went almost unnoticed amidst the sea of protests and assassinations. In a desperate gamble, the administration completely rewrote the mission parameters for the upcoming Apollo 8 mission, from a simple lunar module test to a manned circumlunar voyage unlike anything planned before by either space program. The odds were clearly against the astronauts. It was said that there were three equally likely outcomes to Apollo 8. The mission would succeed and the astronauts would return to Earth safely, the mission would fail but the astronauts would return to Earth safely, or the mission would fail and everyone would die horribly.
Despite the overwhelmingly grim predictions of failure, however, Frank Borman, William Anders, and James Lovell beat not just the odds to reach the moon, but also every single grand event of 1968 to become Time Magazine's Men of the Year. In going to the moon and back, the three had become the first humans to venture beyond the gravitational influence of the Earth, the first humans to orbit a celestial object other than the Earth, and the first humans to see the whole Earth in picture. It was an achievement that proved the worth of the Apollo hardware, and NASA once again rushed to meet Kennedy's lofty goal. Following Apollo 8 was a blur of test missions leading up to the fateful landing, a low-Earth orbit test of the LM on Apollo 9, and another circumlunar journey on Apollo 10, in which Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan came as close as 15 kilometers to the surface of the moon, as John Young kept watch on the CSM. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin closed the gap and became the first humans to step foot on another celestial body, while CSM pilot Michael Collins watched from above. It was one of the most watched television broadcasts around the globe, an event that was no longer simply reserved for the United States, but for the entire world. In the 15 hours that the two spent on the lunar surface before returning safely to Earth, the gulf of space between our home planet and the moon had been inextricably shortened. In the three years that followed, ten more astronauts joined Armstrong and Aldrin in walking on the moon's dusty planes. From finding old space probes to surviving a near-fatal disaster, from taking a chip shot on the lunar regolith to driving the world's first space car, from bringing back the biggest moon rock ever found to simply falling down a lot, each successive Apollo mission brought home new insight into our closest celestial neighbor. Perhaps most importantly, though, were some of the photographs that made it home alongside the triumphant astronauts. It is not without some irony that the most striking images are not of the dull monochrome of the lunar surface, but of the Earth, seen for the first time by human eyes from hundreds of thousands of miles away. In the words of William Anders of Apollo 8, we came all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth. In the end, the Apollo program was a rousing success, and its triumph was a fitting capstone to perhaps the most chaotic decade of the 20th century. Within the span of a little over eight years, the collective efforts of scientists from both the United States and the Soviet Union had gone from barely being able to catapult a human into space to walking on the surface of another world. By the end of 1972, the public's excitement for lunar exploration had died down, and the Apollo program came to a close. Its legacy, however, would never be forgotten. Of course, none of this really matters because, as we all know, the lunar landings were clearly faked.